Hey, welcome back to the Investing Experts Podcast. I'm Daniel Snyder, and it's great to be back. It's been a moment since I've hosted an episode, and I hope you've been enjoying all of the great guests on this show. I'm thrilled to be back because a good friend of mine, great guest, fan favorite of the show, Chris DeMuth Jr. is back with us today. Chris, thank you for joining us. Good to be here. Thank you very much for having me. So I want to give a little teaser about what we're going to go over through this episode that people can make sure they listen to the end because the end is an individual stock idea that you are holding in your individual account. Is that right? Correct. It's In fact, it's the only stock I'm holding in my individual personal account. And this is coming from, you know, we've had conversations over the last two to three years. I can't keep track now. We've talked about Activision. We've talked about Twitter. You have litigation. You've had so many great calls. And you've shared it with our audience time and time again. So I can't say I appreciate you enough. But before we get into the stock idea and what we're going, what's going on there, I wanted to get your take on what's going on with the oil and gas market lately. Because we've seen the price of oil just start to ramp up incredibly right now. I've heard people whisper that this is a new top for oil, gasoline, they're pulling back, things like that. But what are your thoughts on that specific market and how are you handling it? Uh, The energy sector is far and away our biggest um, sector uh, exposure. Uh, We don't really look to make sector bets. Uh, We look to underpay. Uh, but I keep stumbling into opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to underpay in energy. And uh, uh, I don't seek thematic wisdom. I, I seek underpaying and I, I, I want to I wanna buy a dollar of value for 50 cents and I want to get my dollar back. And I'm happy to do that in boring ways. I'm happy to do it in ways that I don't understand. I'm happy to do it in ways wherever I can find a counterparty. But what's interesting about oil and gas is the counterparty's telling me that they make no sense, or they're telling me in their vernacular that they're trying to do something different. They're trying to divest oil and gas. They're trying to divest the way that people in the past uh, divested from South Africa, or people have had campaigns to divest against Israel. And those are not people who are saying, I'm being rational and self-seeking. They're people saying that we have a uh, a view, an almost religious view uh, or political view against this thing and we're trying to hurt it. Now, it's not clear to me how you hurt it as a public security if they don't need to raise more capital, uh, but the oil and gas sellers, I think, are driven by a uh, kind of religious fervor that has led to real world consequences where both government policy and large asset allocators have uh, done something uh, with um, uh, ESG that is very light on the G, which is the the G part I've always been quite uh, a fan of, uh, and pretty heavy on the E. And the E says we need to invest in uh, intermittent energy, uh, energy sources that I think are Uh, okay, uh, sometimes even good uh, uh, supplements in very specific geographies, Um, their environmental benefits are massively attenuated if you look cradle to grave at the costs of their inputs, right? Like a lot of uh, ideas in politics, uh, they're well served if you focus on the intent and the very kind of narrow aperture of what the fans want you to look at. If you look at all of the chemicals that go into it and so forth, it's a lot less clear that it's good for the environment. But intermittent energy has, there's a time and place for it. That time and place is not replacing all hydrocarbons, uh, and it's not a solution that's going to come close to human demonstrable demand for many, many decades. So I think you have a uh, industry that's been the most sec- uh, the most um, uh, cyclical of uh, uh, industries where the cycle is essentially being broken, where the companies that I like to invest in, instead of uh, putting a lot of money in CapEx or just spewing capital back to owners, uh, we're getting big uh, dividends, special dividends, m and uh, they are just returning capital uh, out of being told by friends and enemies alike, uh, stop increasing supply. At the same time, demand, the same politicians say, uh, keep stimulating uh, demand. And then they say, why are prices going up? Well, you know, if you if you were awake halfway through the first class of Econ 101, you'd say that's just what happens. And I think the prices are just starting to rise. 
Um, so uh, uh, who knows what cruise does short term, what gas does short term, but there's a lot of companies that you can set up where you're basically paying for a market cap where they're going to get their market cap back in cash within the next few years. So I think the sector has amazing opportunities. Um, the sector has been its own worst enemy in terms of management that kind of uh, over uh, invests uh, at uh, the worst possible moment um, uh, at the top, uh, but they're not doing that this time. They're just not. And if uh, prices are even approximately like what they are today, it's going to be great for a lot of oil and gas equities. And if uh, it improves from here, it could be a bonanza. So let's dive a little bit deeper into that. It sounds like you're avoiding the CapEx side of the industry. You're not looking for companies that are drilling new infrastructure, but maybe you're looking at midstream, you're you're talking about the end of the line. So how should investors approach this sector at this time? So there's there's uh, undersized upstream. Um, a unit corp is something, um, a UNTC uh, that our firm has a significant exposure to. Um, and that's one that they've just been basically uh, distributing money back to shareholders as fast as possible uh, whenever there's excess uh, cash. And that I think that's quite likely that they will sell um, all of these kind of with under a billion dollar market caps. You'll look at and think that should be a part of a major. There's really no reason why. Um, there, there's no efficiencies at that scale. Um, I would say that we are um, shareholders of many of the potential and uh, definitive deal targets. Uh, you know, we um, own uh, a, a Denbury, uh, ticker DEN, uh, that's in a fairly mundane, I think, kind of cheap price uh, a deal with ExxonMobil. Now, it's an all-stock deal, so it's just a modest discount on Exxon. So a fairly conventional setup, um, but um, but I think Exxon's uh, really underpaying for that. And so there's at least a non-zero shot, kind of comes with a lottery ticket of a better uh, bid emerging. Uh, I don't think we're going to get one. I think we're going to get a, you know, a 5% uh, IRR to owning Exxon. And because I like the sector, I'm fine owning Exxon uh, with a lottery-like upside of uh, something better emerging. So we like the kind of definitive deal targets. Uh, we like some of the upstream uh, UNTC is, I think, a good example. Um, we like some of the refiners. I mean, one thing that we've um, owned for a while now, um, Delic, uh, ticker DK, um, has a public uh, sub. It's, it's a public sub that's not uh, that convenient or cheap to short, um, but X, the sub, we bought it for less than free. It's now a little more than free, but you know you have all of the uh, assets of the whole company basically netted the public uh, uh, subsidiary for free. Very, back in the day, I don't know if uh, this was a kind of uh, the uh, early tech bubble, kind of early turn of the century tech bubble. Uh, Palm had a very famous uh, situation it was the same thing where the, the the sub was actually more expensive than the parent company, uh, which is a real paradox. I mean, I think if you were going to a professor preaching the strong version of the efficient market theory and you just want to disprove that, I think these negative price parent minus subsidiary stubs is pretty much as far as I can tell proof that the market's not perfectly efficient. And you can exploit that with a Delic a DK. So those are just kind of examples, but there's a lot of them. I mean, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of an oil and gas uh, at this point. Uh, I just, I just, I just love them all. Yeah, it's interesting because it's it's a market, as you said. The ESG front without the standard guidelines is obviously kind of a factor into the decision of investors, maybe wanting to stay away, or big fund managers just don't want to get into the sector anymore. But the free cash flow is just incredible, incredible, and all the byproducts that come from oil and crude. I mean, you're talking about jet fuel, the plastics manufacturing, the paint for companies like Sherwin and Williams needs ingredients from oil. The product spans across more industries than some investors realize. So going forward, I think if somebody is looking at oil and gas and they're debating if they want to do an individual name or the ETF like the XLE, would it be better to play the ETF or individual names in this specific sector? I think there. I think I think you can do better uh, if you don't need the liquidity. You know, if you're not putting together, you know, 
if you're investing billions of dollars, it's very different than investing millions. Uh, if you are investing millions, I think the uh, Delix uh, and the unit corps are better. Um, if you're investing billions, that's a lot harder and you end up owning, you know, Buffett buys uh, Oxy and that's Occidental and that's, and that's perfectly okay. Um, I hope and expect to do quite a bit better than that, uh, especially if I'm willing to buy a liquid undersized companies that should get bought. Um, you know, I hope to get both uh, a return of some capital while I wait on getting a return of all of the rest of my capital. The, the analogy I really make uh, is if you look at uh, industry pariahs, uh, and my two favorite examples of this are tobacco with the uh, master settlement agreement in the end of the 20th century. And then if you look at United Health with Obamacare, these companies were just told they were the devil. And uh, in many cases, uh, uh, investors try to stay away, their prices were beat up. But what the government did in response to tobacco and then United Health was basically criminalize its competition, create a barrier to entry that they could have um, been arrested for racketeering if it was private, uh, but they were rhetorically destroying companies that in fact they were destroying the competition. And a hundred years from now, people will be smoking Marlboro Reds and there'll be United Health taking uh, userous cuts of our healthcare system because of the government. They're basically, they made the government uh, limited partners of their business. Uh, state finance requires money from tobacco. Uh, the government's broke and they've kind of had this kind of almost fascistic relationship with these nominally private uh, companies. And I look at oil and gas right now and I think, uh, this is the most hated set of companies and just most rhetorically ravaged companies I've seen since United Health and Altria in the Master Settlement. If you look at how they've done, there's, there's a spectacularly well for the equity holders because the only thing they were left to do was make money and give it back to their shareholders. And uh, they've made extraordinary amounts of money. Uh, and it had almost inverse relationship with the kind of pariah status that the uh, regulators put on them because when they settled and when they wrote legislation, the people who were writing the legislation were the people of these companies. And um, they, uh, uh, they, they they did a lot of things that made it very, very hard to uh, compete with them. And it kind of permanently enshrined their relationship with the state. Um, I think if you look at oil and gas now, um, government's doing everything it can to uh, uh, have maybe short-term rhetorical slights, but long-term benefit for uh, equity holders here. So one more question on this industry before we move on to the next commodity we want to get to. And I've got to ask you about, you know, like I mentioned earlier, oil prices have ramped up. We've had $90 per barrel this week. It's kind of hovering around there right now. The SPR, though, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, is something that, of course, the administration has been looking at. They've been draining. We've seen people all over the Internet talking about how it's getting to lower and lower levels during the times of the Russia-Ukraine war. And it's such an international market. So should investors worry about the SPR being depleted? What are your thoughts on that? Um if it's further depleted, I mean, the, the the physical spaces could collapse. You know, it's really, uh, from an engineering perspective, it's obscene. From its intent, it's obscene. Um, uh, it's been drawn down to win a midterm election so far. It has nothing to do uh, with being strategic, or if it's strategic, it's strategic for particular political purposes. And we just might need it at some point. Um, if I could have my wealth denominated in US dollars or any foreign currency or gold or Bitcoin or barrels of crude, absolutely, I'd prefer to have my wealth just denominated in barrels of crude. I think it's going to store its value better and uh, it's 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 more useful than gold. Um, and uh, uh, so, no, it's obscene to be that short-term focus. But if you look at really on a bipartisan basis, how all of our recent government has acted, it's been a uh, short-term maximalist at really any longer term cost. If you look at our debt and deficits, if you look at how we uh, treat things like this. So yeah, no, we're going to be uh, screwed if we ever need it. Um, and it's really uh, horrible uh, how uh, tawdry uh, our behavior has been towards it. 
Great. Let's go ahead and leave that there. Now, moving on to this next topic, I am actually thrilled to talk about because while I was prepping for this episode, I went over to Seeking Alpha and I went to the top ETF screener. And I kid you not, three of the top five names have to deal with this commodity that we're going to talk about right now. So let's dive into it. We're talking about uranium, actually. So just kind of give me the gist. I don't know much about this sector or the commodity. So being an investor that doesn't know anything, how would you guide me with this specific commodity right now? I told you in oil and gas how much I love the oil and gas equities. We actually have no commodity exposure in oil and gas. We have no exposure to the commodity as a commodity. We have a ton of exposure to oil and gas equities that are very exposed to it. Uh, uranium is sort of the opposite situation for me. Um, there are a lot of rogues and pirates and scoundrels that run uh, uranium companies, especially uh, miners. They've done very, very well recently. Um, hold a gun to my head. I probably see more shorts there than longs. Um, it's, uh, uh, a, um, it's an interesting area. I, I like energy generally, like oil and gas, uh, very, very, uh, cyclical, um, but has had these just huge, uh, dry spells that are kind of hard for honest men to cope over the long term. So you, you turn to other things. Uh, there's probably some very nice, good, quality people who run uranium companies who are going to hate me for saying that, but I own none. We have um, uh, a huge exposure to the uh, commodity itself, the physical commodity itself. Um, I wrote in the first half of this year, I wrote a piece called The Green Energy Future Glows. And it's basically saying that um, if oil and gas is my effort to not take ESG too seriously and kind of be a counterparty, uh, for uh, a religion that is not my religion and that I believe has a multi-decade gap between uh, human demand and uh, hypothetical green supply. Um, uranium is my effort to actually take it seriously and say, okay, well, if we are going to supply demonstrable human demand um, and there's something kind of... Um, uh, snobbish and obnoxious about a lot of the Western first world assumptions on demand that presupposes that the assumer is warm in winter, cool in the summer, lights on at night, uh, travels, includes flies wherever they want to, uh, and uh, uh, has full use of energy. Uh, my view is that that's what everybody wants. And that as people in the developing world go from making $1,000 a year to $10,000 a year, they're going to want the same. Uh, and the fact that they've been suffering historically isn't an indication of uh, what, what they've wanted. It's, it's what they could have. And once they get a little taste of that, they're never going back. Once they get a taste of individual transportation, they're never going to go back. And the uh, price uh, elasticity will reflect that. And so we have this huge increase in demand that's very likely in the years ahead and supply is being artificially constrained by politicians and asset allocators alike. But nuclear actually can fill a huge part of that gap. We're going to need hydrocarbons. We can use uh, uh, wind to chop up birds and to provide a little bit of energy from time to time. And we can use uh, solar power. Uh, uh, the, there's enough uh, slave labor to pull the needed uh, uh, chemicals out of the ground for solar. Uh, we can use that too. Uh, I, I don't stipulate much of the moral or environmental case for either, but I will stipulate that they can produce a little peak energy here and there. Uh, but we're going to need coal, we're going to need oil, we're going to need gas. But uranium is where we can have a huge part of that demand served in ways that are not carbon intensive. Uh, not my beat, but listening to other people, uh, 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 when, I, when I'm not in Connecticut, I'm in Maine, so a little global warming probably uh, at least several months a year sounds pretty good to me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, uh, it, it, it's not my religion, it's not my beat, but it's a lot of people's. And I think that uh, uranium is a big uh, part of that solution. It's a much smaller component uh, as a commodity to the uh, energy production than coal, oil, gas, really any, any of the others. Um, it's kind of almost incidental. Uh, the supply uh, is 
long-term available, but in the, the spot market in the next few years, I think the, the chance for it to double several times over, I think is really, really high. Um, I think that the industry is um, kind of lackadaisical about it, uh, apathetic. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to get fired for under reserving for uranium. And even if it doubles and doubles again, I don't know that people get fired for it within the industry. I think you can just buy it at the uh, price later on, and it's not going to be seen as a scandal um, in the way that people who have it as a much bigger uh, a component price, uh, a component part of the price of production uh, could get fired for. So I think they're uh, apathetic. Um, and I think that uh, the left's hatred of nuclear has just been collapsing. You know, you see it in very progressive countries in Europe, uh, really subtly changing the definition from uh, intermittent, they don't like that phrase, but you know, whatever the alter, alternate sources to, you know, kind of non carbon intensive, kind of creeping nuclear back into the definition of what they're for in a lot of countries where if they take their carbon footprint seriously and they want the lights on, uh, that uh, this is the way out of that conundrum. So the underlying message there is own the commodity, not the stocks, right? Or let me know what's better than that. I, I would love, I, I would phrase it more as a question. I own the commodity, not the stocks. Um, I own the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust units. Um, for an American like me, it is a, uh, uh, my, my deep uh, and abiding loathing of taxes comes back with uh, a, a special loathing of uh, PFIX and the tax status of this uh, uh, trust because it's Canadian. But I trust it, and I think it is going to do spectacularly well from here, and I'm in the market for something better. So when I say, that's what I'm doing, show me something better, it is a literal, sincere plea and not a rhetorical uh, uh, feign uh, in the comments, in responses. Please uh, hit me up. If you're, if you're a honest CEO of a uranium company that's undervalued, and you're not a pirate, and you took umbrage at me saying you guys are a bunch of pirates, then uh, give me a call or send me a note. I'd love to find something more tax efficient and smarter than just owning a pile of physical uranium. Uh, but that's the best I got so far. Slide into Chris Demuth's inbox. I love it. Now let's go ahead and dive into this stock that we kind of teased out at the beginning of the show. The one stock you have in your individual account. I'm kind of intrigued because, by it because it's a cannabis play, but it's more a bank play instead of just cannabis. So why don't you go ahead and tell everybody what it is and what your thesis is behind it? Sure. I need, I need two, uh, two uh, throat clearing uh, uh, caveats and then I'll dive right into it. Uh, first throat clearing caveat is professionally, I own a diversified portfolio. We look at a lot of litigation, especially antitrust, IP, nationalization, uh, we do some merger arb, we do event driven, we do various flavors of value investing where we think we can underpay and get our money back. Personally, I can do whatever I want. I tend to do things that I don't have in the fund. In this case, uh, for strange reasons, we own it in both places. Um, but it's basically um, uh, a small and a liquid uh, company, uh, but it's the one stock that I own personally in my individual account. Um, the other caveat I'll give is that uh, I uh, totally reject the concept of sin stocks. Uh, 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 what, uh, what, uh, what, there's 8 billion versions of what people consider to be sins. I think the job of capitalism is to provide uh, goods and services that people think they want, not what they should want, at prices they're willing to pay. So I'm willing to invest in anything that's uh, legal uh, and uh, that. Uh, is an honest uh, arbiter of what they're doing, in this case, cannabis. I've never smoked cannabis or anything else. Uh, but those are my two thro throat clearing. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm happy to invest in alcohol, cannabis, tobacco, ultra-processed foods, all sorts of things that I wouldn't want in my own body, but I own my own body and you own yours, and so take as much cannabis as you want. 
uh, SHF Holdings, ticker SHFS. I own the equity. I actually own some of the warrants, which are SHFSW, which I can talk about as well. It's small. It's illiquid. It's my one stock I personally own. And it is uh, the only NASDAQ-listed, fully compliant fintech that serves the cannabis industry. So if you are a cannabis provider, uh, I mean, something physically dangerous about it has been people have stacks of hundreds of dollars of bills and safes uh, and are really disconnected from the modern 21st century financial world. And uh, this is a company that has been uh, around for almost a decade, and it is kind of the one um, serious compliant fintech company for cannabis. So obviously a huge issue that even our government is trying to figure out here in the United States. And yep. there is this news, I think it was just this morning, we're taping this September 21st, about the SAFER Act mm -hmm. that they are working on. It's trying to help out how they're going to regulate the financial side of the industry for cannabis. Because as you just mentioned, people are holding a ton of cash and that might go to other things like avoiding some tax payments. We don't know. But yep. who knows what's going on behind the scenes, right? So what is your opinion on this SAFER Act? Do you think it's going to pass? They have a committee markup on the September 27th. What are your thoughts here? So the entire life of this company, uh, SHF, has been during the hopes and expectations and shattered dreams of full national legalization, rescheduling, and regulation of finance. Um, what I love about this investment is it wins either way. Uh, it is uh, it is becoming a profitable business. Um, we can talk about how they make money, but in the current status, the longer it's in the gray market, the bigger that's going to grow, the longer they're going to be able to take outside profits from an area where they basically don't have competition. And once it's legalized, the music stops and they get bought the next day or so, where a kind of plain vanilla uh, a mainstream company is going to want a maybe six to 18 month head start and is going to buy them. And it's even at a, even at a, you know, 10 times the current market cap, it would be a tiny little acquisition for them. Um, so, uh, so I'm, my preferences are mixed. Uh, my expectation is that this is not something that's going to happen this year. It's not something that's going to happen next year. Uh, the window starts to open in 2025, and that would be fine with me. That would be ideal for SHF. Um, you know, we have, um, a set in a house that have different uh, problems. It's been held hostage in the past, but I would say a solid majority of legislatures' true view is that this is legislation that should pass. And there's all sorts of machinations around, is it being held hostage? Is it part of this bill or is it that? Is it gonna hurt the other side or help the other side during an election year? And so it's kind of hard to run the table uh, in 2024 with complex issues with a executive that does not have a very good congressional um, relationship uh, with two houses of opposite parties that don't have good relationships with each other, and all three are right around parity. And so, you know, there's a lot you can get done when it's 60. 40 that you can't get done when it's closer to 50 50 because everybody's just grabbing for that kind of short-term advantage versus things kind of settling so i think the easiest route in 2025 is if biden won uh but you could see a republican version of this too so you just need a little bit of clarity uh and maybe a little bit more of a stable majority and this will get signed into law um I think the culture has moved so far and younger members of both houses and both parties have moved so far that we are going to get this law. And meanwhile, we're going to make money and grow and become more kind of operationally uh, sound. And then everything changes the next day once it's just like any other industry. The thing that's amazing is that, you know, I always say it's in the if it's in the press, it's in the price. And I say, you know, well, uh, the market's a discounting mechanism, but this is in the press. It's not in the price and the market's not a discounting mechanism because a lot of mainstream investors are simply going to wait until the law is done and then they're going to pour in capital and competition the next day. 
how the existing industry is impacted by this one very good thing and one very bad thing is going to be what determines the winners and losers in cannabis. Great point. Now, I want to go to an article you just put out. You said that the number of states with legal cannabis could rise from 23 to 31. Maybe you can touch on your thoughts there. But then also as a follow up, if you could just walk us through how SHF actually makes money off of being the fintech to those cannabis companies. Yeah, so we have at the state level, we're making a lot more progress than at the uh, federal level. And uh, that's very, very good for this company that does uh, the finance. Uh, the, the thing I'm really waiting on at the federal legislation is when a mainstream company is going to buy them, kind of the exit, the end result, I think, is going to be mainstreaming this. And that's going to come after federal legislation. Uh, but at the state level, it's more and more states that we can do business in. How they profit, and it really uh, uh, is important to understand this because it's really changed a lot and improved a lot recently, and nobody's following this company. I mean, it's virtually unknown, so I don't think, uh, I don't think people have really gone through the math. Um, there's kind of five things that are really changing. Um, one is uh, that they capture the float on the deposits. When interest rates were zero, that wasn't a valuable thing. But now at about 5.4%, they get 75% of interest on that cash. It works out to about 4% uh, the value of their float on deposits. Um, and other contracts, it's 50-50, but they have a very, very uh, good relationship with one credit union. They have good relationships with a bunch of other banks. And so they get a lot of money on float. They just signed a new deal with Five Star Bank, FISI is the ticker in New York, but they're going to take that national. So we could end up with this huge deposit base flipping 4%. Service charges on accounts in cannabis are extremely profitable. It works out to about $800 per account per month. Um, they don't have other choices. SHF charges a lot of fees. They pay the credit union or banks. It works out to about $25 per account per month and keep the rest. Um, so uh, that net amount is um, very, very valuable on uh, service uh, fees. Uh, lending, they get 1.5% origination fees. They get about 10% net interest. Their first loss on loans that they originate but they get to use the balance sheets of the banks and uh, credit of the credit union uh, that they came out of. And the loans are quite good. They're low, low loan to value, uh, typically real estate loan, but they have as collateral the real estate, but it has extra coverage because they also have the cannabis license and also personal guarantees. So dealing with people who don't have options, you have kind of massively over collateralized loans that you're getting 10% plus a one and a half percent origination fee on, uh, which is a great business. At the same time, their expenses are declining. They've kind of gotten to be more efficient with scale, uh, expenses going down, a big uh, uptick in earnings because of the higher interest rate from the credit union relationship. This new FISI relationship could really grow it. And so they're making money, they're profitable, and uh, the market just hasn't seen it yet. And that's what we're doing while we're waiting. And so that's going to be one year, two years, three years, five years, some number of years between now and an exit. I think the exit comes very quickly after full legalization. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, you're uh, playing a game uh, without competitors. And to break it down, the exit being an acquisition, is that right? Yes. No, I think, uh, you know, you look at the uh, stock price is under a dollar now, which I think is just uh, left for dead, misunderstands the nature of it. Uh, the balance sheet is uh, a problem, but it's kind of a problem between semi-related parties that are all working together to maximize the value of this public company. Um, it's not going to file for bankruptcy. It's not going to be diluted towards zero. Um, it's worth one to two dollars today as a standalone. It's worth three to four dollars a share with this legislation. It's worth five today as a takeover candidate um, that, you know, could come within the next two or three years, um, could be more. Um, the math on the warrants are a lot more complicated because you have to figure out prefs, dilution, timing, and so forth, but they cost almost nothing and are probably worth, um, you know, uh, high teens, number of pennies, maybe 20 cents, um, 
in a takeover. They're probably worthless other than in a takeover because the strike price is well above where a takeover probably would be uh, done at. But um, in a takeover, you know, you get kind of a Black Shoals valued uh, uh, price for them. Um, my guess it'll work out to be kind of 20 cents or so. Then there's a lot of leverage beyond that. If it's a low exit price from here, say if the uh, stock is a 2x from here, the warrants are 2.5x. It uh, doesn't sound that much more exciting, um, but then it very quickly gears in the direction of the warrants in a bonanza scenario. So I own a little bit of both, um, but the stock's already small, already liquid, and already very, it's a leveraged equity, right? It's a lottery ticket where you will make many times your money if this even is approximately right. So I don't know if you need even more of those characteristics with the warrant. <laughs> Chris, let's go ahead and wrap it up there. I can't thank you enough for coming, sharing that name, talking to us about commodities today. Obviously, just a reminder to everyone listening, the ticker is SHFS. Really can't thank you enough. Oh, a, way, a way to remember it is it used to be called a better name, uh, uh, Safe Harbor. Kind of confusing because in their presentation, it's Safe Harbor. So you can remember Safe Harbor uh, and it's a financial company. So SHF Safe Harbor Financial Holdings. And I just want to say for everyone that wants to check out more of your research, they should head over to Seeking Alpha, check out Sifting the World. You have a newsletter too, I believe. Is that right? Yes. So I have a new one coming out. Um, I'm complicated and I'm, I just do the content. I respond to whatever somebody asked me to write. We have a new free newsletter coming out. Please go to Seeking Alpha, click on follow for free. You'll get this and other hopefully good ideas. Um, but I do uh, uh, my investing writing there and this new one should be coming out uh, any day now. Yeah. And everyone, I mean, I read all of your stuff. I hope everybody else will indulge in it as well. Everybody that's looking at mergers and acquisitions and litigation, Chris is your guy. He's helped me personally 10 times over, I feel like already. So I hope you enjoyed the episode. Chris, thank you again once more. And everyone have a great day. We'll see you next episode. Just a reminder, anything you hear on this podcast should not be considered investment advice. This is for entertainment purposes only, and you should seek advice from a licensed professional before investing. If you enjoyed the episode, leave a rating or review on your favorite podcasting app, and we'll see you soon with a new episode.